The Week in Bible Prophecy, a Prophecy Watchers podcast. Welcome to The Week in Bible Prophecy, and here we are with L.A. Marzulli. Welcome. Great to be here, Mondo. Thanks for having me on. You know, this is going to be a, a great podcast because, you know, really the goal, uh, L.A., of this podcast is to, just to talk about The Week in Bible Prophecy. And I think with what has been happening to... To, to our culture as it relates to UFOs and aliens, and I want to get into all that. Uh, but before we do, you're going to be with us uh, here in, uh, in late February, yep. early March, at the Orlando Prophecy Summit. And uh, so if you haven't had a chance to, to check that out, you can go to orlandoprophecysummit.com. But 18 speakers that are going to be there, certainly, like I said, you're going to be there. We have uh, others talking about all the latest things that are, that are happening. One of them is, again, UFOs, aliens, and which when we think aliens right there out of the gate, you know, I don't want people to turn off because our government now mm-hmm. is talking about aliens. And so what you've been doing and, and what I want to talk about today is the latest research that you've been doing for really decades. But most importantly, you have a, an, uh, well, it'll eventually be nine parts in a UFO alien series. Uh, that uh, you're here, we've been doing some other programs. But l- let's come right out of the gate here for those that are wondering, uh, what, wh- why are these Christians, why are Prophecy Watchers you, why are you giving your, your, so much of what you've been doing lately, why are we talking about aliens? H- how does it connect with prophecy? And uh, kind of give us the biblical framework for why, again, even you've been doing what you're doing. Well, I mean, that's, that's uh, <laughs> it's like loaded, a 20-part yeah, 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 question. Thank you, Mondo. How about just a yes or a no? No, but what, what's happening is this. Um, we are warned in the biblical prophetic narrative by Jesus himself, it'd be like the days of Noah. So what differentiates the days of Noah? Well, it's the eruption of the seed war. What's the seed war? We've got to go back to Genesis 3.15. Hats off to elder brother Gary Stearman, who illuminated that entire passage of scripture way back in the Nephilim Mounds Conference um, over a decade ago, I believe now. And we all sat there, we all went to school, Russ Dizdar, myself, Fritz Zimmerman, Chief Joseph Riverwin. Genesis 3.15 sets up the rest of the biblical narrative. It is the gateway, in my opinion, to the entire Bible because it sets up exactly what's going to happen. Again, that little vignette is you've got the pre-incarnate Jesus, you've got Adam and Eve over here, and you've got the dragon, you've got Satan. And Jesus says to the dragon, your seed, your offspring will be at enmity at war with the seed, the offspring of the woman, the one coming from the woman, the proto-evangelium, will crush your head, you will bruise his heel. So you say, well, L.A., so what? Are you kidding me? That's the gateway. That's the gateway to the... Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus in the garden, is giving us the entire biblical progression. What's going to happen, how all this plays out in a couple of sentences. It's beyond mind-blowing. And then, of course, three chapters later in Genesis 6, and this is where it goes off the rails for some of you. Oh, angels can't procreate, blah, blah, blah. It's the sons of Seth and all this other stuff. It's not what the text says, and we can argue about it. To the cows come home, um, because the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God, the B'nai Elohim, went into the daughters of man and created these offspring known as the Nephilim, the giants. Some of them were giants. And, I mean, I've written books about this. I spent my life really, in the last 15 years, just doing a deep dive into the subject. And now there's 13 books and almost and 30 films, basically, that deal with this in one way, shape, or another. So <clears throat> we know that there's a seed war, absolutely. And the seed war fully manifests. And this is where, see, if, you don't, if we don't believe in, in the literal interpretation of Genesis 15, then when we get to Genesis 6, we throw that out the window and we plug in the Sethite theory, which says it's the godly line of Seth and the Huchi Mom is a Cain, but that's not in the text. Not even close. You know, yeah, not even close. close. It's mm-hmm. the B'nai Elohim in the Hebrew, which always refers to the angelic host. So, if we don't get Genesis 3.15 right, then we don't get Genesis 6 right. Then we don't get Abraham and the five kings, then we don't get Sodom and Gomorrah, then we don't get the conquest of Canaan. Mm-hmm. And I left out uh, the Tower of Babel because it's all the same stuff. When we get to the conquest of Canaan, it's the seed war, and this is something the Lord gave me just fairly recently. It's the seed war fully manifesting. And what I mean by that, you've got 400 years of the seed of Abraham, which Abraham's been tapped out. Now remember that, so that's, that's the game changer. Yeah, they're in Egypt. They're, they're, in, they're Egypt. in Egypt for 400 years. And then they come out. 
All the tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, they all come out. And guess, and, and they, they won't go in, so that generation goes up, but the 12 tribes are still there. And then finally they go in, and who's on the field of battle? It is the tribes of the Nephilim. So you have the seed of the dragon and what will be the seed of the woman mm -hmm. meeting with each other for the first time ever in the history yeah, of the world. They're, they're squaring off. They're squaring off. It is at when, you, when we look at it that way, you go, oh my gosh. So we know something's going on with the seed. I get that. So now we move into the words of Jesus thousands of years later, who tells us that, that men and women will faint from fear for what is coming upon the earth, that even the elect would be deceived if that were possible. Paul adds to that, that uh, Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. You start putting that together in a cosmic blender and you wind up with where we are now. If this wasn't, if the UFO phenomena wasn't manifesting, I wouldn't be talking about it. I'd be looking for what was. Right, yeah. But this is what's manifesting. Your government, our government, has stated on the record that UFOs are real. I add the word burgeoning and, mm -hmm. and falling away, but they are real. Our Pentagon, your Pentagon, has stated that we have crashed UFOs. We've recovered UFOs. We have, we have some of them that are still intact. How does that work? I believe that there was a quid pro quo decades ago in the, in the days of Eisenhower, where he just disappears off the scene for basically over 24 hours, and that's the Holloman Air Force Base deal where there's a face-to-face -face meeting and there's a little treaty signed. Yeah. They get access to the population and we get the equipment, which is right out of the Book of Enoch, days of Noah, there it is again. And so this is what's manifesting. And then you get the congressional hearings where David Grush, who's a whistleblower, comes before the con uh, Representative Mace. And I'll be talking about all of this at the Prophecy Watchers Conference, shameless plug. And in that, uh, Mace says, well, you know, do, do we have crashed UFOs? And Grush says, yes. Did you recover any bodies in these UFOs? And he said, yes, we have biologics. And then she asked him, were they human or non-human? He looks right up at her and he says, they were non-human. Yeah. I mean, I'm not, it's no longer L.A. Marzulli frantically waving his arms 25 years ago saying this is the coming great deception. That title I penned in my very first book, Nephilim which was published by Zondervan in 1998-99. Now, Brad Myers may have come up with the same verbiage, the coming great deception. I don't know. I didn't know Brad then. So whether, you know, sometimes the Lord gives two or three oh, people yeah, the same sure. thing. But I, I tip my hat to Brad anyway because I don't know. Well, I mean, this, it comes out of Second Thessalonians 2 talking about... He the strong was, delusion. Yeah, he'll send them strong delusion or the great delusion, depending on your translation. I think what people need to understand is that... Um, in, in Matthew 24, you know, 37, when, when Jesus talks about uh, the, the days of the Son of Man being like the days of Noah, mm -hmm. there's no doubt he, in the next couple of verses, he's talking about immorality, planting, you know, building, selling, having marriage. There's no doubt there's a, one of the aspects there is a lack of, of uh, preparation, of awareness. They were unaware when the flood came and, and took them all away. But what you do see, I think, is... The days of Noah, J Jesus is telling us that the, the, he says the same phraseology in Luke 17. And, and he uses a very specific Greek phrase there, at least Luke does, that th th this is the pattern, and it's multiple patterns. It's actually plural. It's pretty fascinating. But what you have in Genesis 6 in the days of Noah was a supernatural intervention mm -hmm. taking place that was deceiving mankind mm -hmm. uh, into immorality. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly the, the fathers were, were receiving knowledge. They were giving their, their, their daughters over to these angelic beings for the sake of, of forbidden knowledge. So when we come to the end of the age, again, what do we see? We see a supernatural intervention uh, that was blatant as well as deception. So th those are to me are the two big things that um, are going to be as, it, as we approach the end of the age is a deception. But the angels are not going to be operating from a distance. They were not operating from heaven with deception. They were mingling amongst humanity in order to bring deception. So if we take that pattern, it's clear that we're, we're, they're not going to be armchair I I influencers. They're going to be coming down influencing in a very direct way. So this leads us to recognizing, if you're just not even a Christian, that if you're listening to this, think about what our culture has been doing 
for the last 50, 60 years, we're going to talk specifically about Roswell in a moment, but we have the culture, we have Marvel, we have uh, Independence Day, we have all the, these other things just from a Hollywood perspective. Hundreds of movies. Hundreds of movies Hundreds. Sh shaping the culture. Correct. But now, really from 2017 on, we have this idea of, of an alien presence not being tinfoil hat anymore. It's coming in through the government. They're in meetings. They're having spending billions of dollars now creating uh, agencies and, and, and agencies that work together to communicate. So this isn't tinfoil hat stuff anymore. That's why here we are. It's important for the church to seek to equip the church from a biblical perspective at recognizing things. This is why, again, we're having this conversation. You, have, you and I have spent a lot of time on this. So this, the, 2017, I really want you to get into this. Your series, nine parts, we, we've referenced it. Um, you began to say, I need to create a progression of films that gives the the history mm -hmm. from 2007. You were stirred. You've all been doing this for a long time. It's been in your wheelhouse. But you said, no, no, I want to make a series. Talk about that. Well, it, it started off um, in 2016 where I was filming, um, you know, the whole UFO disclosure thing. Um, you know, UFOs are real, burgeoning, not going away. I remember sitting down with Paul McGuire and said, Paul, you know, in your opinion, when do you think we'll have disclosure? Now, this is 2016. And, and McGuire's going, well, we might see something this year from the powers that be, but definitely by, by the end of 2017. And sure enough, at the end of 2017 in December, Commander David Favor appears on Tucker Carlson's show. And it's a triptych. They've got Tucker here, Commander David Favor in the, in the center, and over here on the far right, you've got, um, so it's a triptych, three, three things that you're looking at, three, three pictures. They've got the tic-tac-shaped object which was at one time classified film. Now it's not, it's on Tucker Carlson. We're all getting to see it. And Commander David Fravor, when asked by Tucker Carlson, in your opinion, what do you think this is or was? And, and Fravor looks right at the camera and says, whatever this was, was not of this earth. And because now, be, I want you to continue, but people understand, this was a physical object yeah. that they were getting by their radar, radar and other things, other tracking mechanisms that are physical. It's not a light in the sky. No. This was actually something physical. Yeah, there's a, there's a definite physicality to it, but there's no rotor wash, there's no there's no landing gear, there's no wings. It's moving at right angle turns. It's it's a disc, it's a craft, and it, it's got physicality. And when and it, and it actually came towards Commander David Fribble, we found this out later, and jammed his radar. That's an act of war. And then it shot off like a bullet out of a gun, 50 miles in like you know two seconds. Mm -hmm. How is that possible? It's not possible by our physics. We'd be crushed. Instantly, yeah, something else but is going on here. Something Advanced, else. It's, it's yeah. moving. It's moving through space and time and bending space and time. So there is no gravity, as we know. Yeah, they don't need to because it's, it's basically in a in a, in a gravity yeah. Uh, shell. Yeah. So it's able to yeah. do whatever it wants in there because it's shaping gravity around it, uh, whatever that means. But so so we see this. We we see the launching on the scene of that really was the beginning of what we the rung. That's a different book, the rungs of disclosure. But talk about just here a few weeks ago, not even a few weeks ago, I think it was last week, uh, you mentioned Tucker Carlson, his discussion where he talks about, he, he was, I think it was Clayton Morris on the, the show Redacted, where he, he's being, Tucker's being interviewed and he says, well, some of these things I can't really talk about because I've, I've had some inside scoop. But he begins to, I mean, Tucker, I don't understand as being a born again Christian. He's certainly conservative and maybe he's Catholic or something, I don't know. But he's recognizing and he's talking about a spiritual connection. Yeah, he is. And we would love to get the, uh, to Tucker Carlson um, just, just to talk to him and give him our side of the story. There is an absolute spiritual connection to these things. They manipulate these entities. They have a nefarious agenda. And I love sitting down with the other people on the other side of the aisle, the New Agers. Um, and they'll go, well, you know, cattle mutilations, I mean, okay, it looks a little grisly, but, you know, they're, they're putting the cow back in the field. And I go, <laughs> nonsense, they're putting the cow back in the field, which creates the greatest climate of fear in the entire town. Yeah, it's, this is not benign. You know, this is not some benign, happy little ending. I mean, I, I, I spent four months editing the cattle mutilation film. It's the darkest film I have ever, ever worked on. I would work on it for an hour or two and then go screaming out of my studio, I can't do this anymore. And even when Gil Zimmerman and I were working on it together, putting the final touches on, I said, I would walk out and I said, I can't do this anymore, Gil, because it's so dark and there is no happy ending no, to it. No and the bottom line is the currency of the, of the, of the kingdom of, 
of the dragon. The kingdom of Satan is always one of fear. So when the cow is dropped back into the field or placed back into the field, the farmer comes out, he sees the cow is mutilated, there's no blood on the ground, the eyeball is completely carved out, the, the jaw around, the flesh around the jaw is completely down to the bone, the tongue is excised all the way back into the throat. These aren't predators. This isn't no, a satanic cult. There's no blood in the animal. The rancher looks at this. He's scared absolutely out of his mind. He go gets his wife and the kids. They come out. They look at it. They go, oh my gosh, are we next? E even animals won't eat the carcass. Animals, the car won't even get near Coyotes, it. I mean, seriously. Won't this, eat anything. They won't even touch it. I mean, get near it. They, that tells you, again, something What's major. going on. Uh -huh. So then, then the veterinarian comes out. He looks at it. He's never seen anything like this before. He takes some pictures. You know, he writes about it. He's freaked out. Finally, the, you know, law enforcement comes out, but then the local news reporter comes out. He gets one of the thing. Click, 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 does a couple of pictures. Now it's in the local paper. Fear, 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 and fear. Now you've got from one mutilation, the rings of fear are just spiraling out of control. And people need to know that, uh, you know, starting back in the 60s and 70s, um, th these things have been going on, and the, and the FBI research this. I mean, Never. people yeah. people can Completely look this up online. It, they yes. researched all this and, and you know, uh, thousands of cases. It's it's happened tens of thousands of times and they didn't research every last one of them. But uh, when you do the research and you can get their report uh, mm -hmm. online that the FBI is like, well, we know it wasn't an, an occultic group uh, because there was no evidence of any uh, nothing. footprints or footprints, anything else. Nothing. Their motive, it was kind of weird. There's no it, blood anywhere. There's no blood. Carnivores, it wasn't that. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't for uh, like just uh, pranks. So th at the end of the day, they, the, the thousands of hours that they spent, they recognized well, we don't really know what it is. But we, they did know that it cost a lot of people money, and it did bring what you just said. It brought a lot of fear and concern among ranchers. I mean, tens. I mean, millions and millions of dollars of, of lost animals. Yeah, over the, over the decade, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. So so give me the because uh, I think this is important. Give me at least the the flow from your first film all the way to where you're you're getting ready to release number nine in January of 2024. Give me the flow of the progress of your film titles. Well, you know, I'm the guy that's been saying UFOs are real burgeoning and not going away for decades now. Uh, we're warning the church about the coming great deception. So when Commander David Fravor came out in 2017 with his statement, I immediately wrote a book, UFO Disclosure, the 70-year-old cover-up exposed. And then I went back and I looked at the, the film that we did uh, on UFOs. And I just went, it was too long, and I did a director's cut, which became the first film in the series. It was a redo of that film. We left a lot of stuff out. But it was, it was to show that the, that the uh, and that's when the Paul McGuire mm -hmm. uh, interview is. Also, Billy Crone is in that film. Yeah. So there's some really cool stuff in that film. And the second film, uh, we sat down with uh, two expert witnesses, Francisco Carrera, who's the head of Exopolitics Portugal. And he's got a completely different paradigm than I do on this. He believes that they're from another galaxy or you know, they're, they're visiting us. And then Preston Bennett, who's also an author and written numerous books. And I've, been, I've interviewed Preston, my, he, obviously. Does he have a different perspective? Completely, he's, he's, he's new age. Okay. He's the idea of that these are extraterrestrials from some but with far away But with galaxy. a benign intention? No, well, yeah, but eventually. Yeah. Eventually, okay. Yeah. And so does, so does Francisco. Wow, really? But, yeah, but, but they don't know. And so, you know, the, 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 I keep throwing it out. If they're so benign, why not give us the cure to cancer? Yeah, with the you technology know, they have, the, yeah. Why abduct a five-year-old at three o'clock in the morning? And do it over and over and over again. Yep. You know why? Why manipulate sperm for men and ovum for women over and over? Well, and so over so again? so. Okay, you don't get so ahead. That's number two. Yeah. So so number two is what abductions? No. No. Number two is the sitting down with Francisco and and Preston Dennett. Then number three was um, the idea of a lot of witnesses, close encounters of the third and fourth kind, people coming in that have had encounters. Testimonials. Basically. Basically. Testimonies. Mm -hmm person after person after person. And the testimonies are riveting. I mean, they really are. Some of them are unnerving. The fourth film is on abductions. And that's, by this time, I'm working now with Gil Zimmerman, my business partner, and we're you know, trying to raise the bar and get, make the films better. And, and Because, and talk about Gil's that. past for a minute. Uh, for, pardon me? Talk about Gil's past. I yeah, mean, Gil, Gil spent 30 years in the film industry in Disney. And- um, Very and skilled guy, very, very smart skilled. guy. Yeah. Real smart. and he's. He's, um, you know, helped raise the bar and made the films 
And I think each one gets better and better as Gil and I, you know, work out a working relationship. So, you know, he worked at DreamWorks and, and Disney for basically 30 years. So, back and forth, so he back helped forth. with abductions and then what was next? Well, the abduction film, let me talk about that for a second. Um, we're the only Christian film company that's ever done this, hands down. This, this type of a deep dive into the whole phenomenon. We interviewed four people who were abducted. This isn't demonic illusion. And if you go up to them and you tell them it's all in your mind, you're just imagining this, you know, you might get punched in the nose. You know, how, how dare you? You know, you don't know what I went through. You know, Al Matthews talks about being taken. The whole car is taken into the ship. And now he's being lowered in a, a, a beam of the most intense white light you've ever seen in your life. And the car is swaying like this, hits the road and drives by itself. That's not demonic delusion. Sperm is taken from the men. Ovum is taken from the women. Karen and Angela were impregnated. And that baby was taken from them in the third month. That fetus, that, that hybrid entity was taken from them in the third month of uh, the first trimester. What, what, what physical, I mean, for those that are, again, are doubtful on some of this, they, oh, it's in their mind. What, what physical characteristics or remnants, maybe scars or other things like that, maybe talk about the, the, the little boy who was locked up. What, what things that are physical that are in abductions that show it to be outside of that person's yeah. brain? And so so here's, here's Emil Jurek, okay? And I'm interviewing him. Emil has an implant. We took the implant out. We're the only Christian ministry ever to do that. And how many, you know, Dr. Roger Lear, before he passed away, did 17. Our implant was number 16. And um, it's, no, uh, excuse me, our, our implant was number 17. Uh, we, we were the last implant that Roger took out. I, before he died, I, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, Emil's not making this up. There was high strangeness in the operating room. The thing disappeared. We couldn't find that on the ultrasound. One prayer spiritual warfare prayer to the Lord, all of a sudden the thing appears on the screen, everybody goes, oh my gosh, what's that? There's physicality here. There's an implant. We, we took the implant out and we examined it under a scanning electron microscope at SEAL Lab in Los Angeles. It's made out of meteorite metal. So this is an implant into somebody who was abducted. Yeah. yeah, Emil was abducted. And Emil talks about being abducted, being taken at six years old. And they would find him out on the lawn of his grandmother's house or his house. And the grandmother's house had a pool. They'd locked and put locks on the windows and the doors. Remember, he's only a little five or six Because he was boy. getting out. And so they were he like, we're going to lock yeah, him we're in. We're going to lock him in. Mm -hmm. And the next morning, they'd find him out on the lawn. So he looks right at the camera and he just goes, explain that to me. I mean, this man has been, you know, been tortured by these entities. Yeah. And to go before him and said, hey, Emil, it's all in your mind. No, it's not all in your mind. Oh, that implant you had really didn't exist. Oh, there's no entry wound there. You know, it's not an old bicycle accident. But there are well-meaning people in our community who insist that it's all delusion, but it's not delusion. Some of it can be. They certainly, can certainly. implant mm -hmm. images and, and false memories. I totally get that. And I, you know, I'll, I'll you know, give that over in, in a New York minute. But there's a physicality to it. And the physicality, just like the cattle mutilation, he's trying to tell me that's not real. Yeah, yeah. You know, please, the abductions are real. Karen is um, the, the, the tent pole, as Gil likes to call it, of, of film number four on abductions, and which we've been talking about. And um, Karen was taken numerous times. She had a handler. She learned to fly the ship. Really? Just like Preston Dennett's Dolly, who's not a Christian, who had a handler, who never broke free from the phenomena, and learn to fly the ships. And I realized some of you out there are going, LA, that's the craziest thing I've ever heard. Well, you know, we Christians have this truncated view of the supernatural. Do we really think that, that the dragon's not trying to regain territory? Do we really think that he doesn't know the end game and he knows that where he's headed and he wants to desperately take as many people with him? Does he know? And this is why the breeding program is going on. Karen's impregnated. In the third month of her pregnancy, she's re-abducted. And the baby is taken from her. Okay? The child is taken from her. Where does that child go, number one? Number two, when she goes to the OBG one say, This is all medically documented. This is all medically documented. When she goes to the emergency room, are you sure you were pregnant? Yeah, well, you can talk to my OBGYN. Talk to her. Yeah, with the know? blood test showing yeah, she's pregnant. The whole deal. Yep. So it, there's, there's, there's absolute physicality to this. There is a breeding program, Genesis 3.15. This is why it's, it's paramount for us to understand 
the Genesis 3.15 narrative. And then finally, when you get to Daniel chapter 2, verse 43, their seed will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not cleave to them. So here's, here's the kicker. We've talked about this in film number six. So number five is, is on the crop circles. And again, that's we call it the secret language of the dragon because it's all math. Yeah, it's pretty and it's, amazing. It's the crop circles. This isn't stuff. Doug and Dave out there. This isn't I mean, Doug and Dave. Not crop, that there's never no. been f false or, 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 or fake. Of course yeah. there has been. But there's no way that, uh, like the one that you showed in that film, which was great. I mean, it happened overnight. Overnight. I mean, maybe even quicker than that, that no one's out there. So it does not, uh, the fake crop circles cannot account. And then the, the crop circle that we show in the film it was done in a field of standing corn eight feet tall. How do you make a crop circle in a field of corn? You can't possibly In a short do period that. of time. Yeah, yeah, you can't do it. I mean, you know, there's just no way you can do it. Show me. And, and to the level of that geometric per precision yeah, and perfection. Unbelievable. Yeah, unbelievable. So, so there's something, there's something certainly supernatural. That's what we're saying here is here again, Jesus said it himself that there's going to be just like it was in the days where you have supernatural intervention in a real way, not just spiritual temptation. No. This is physical. This is supernatural intervention into humanity behind the scenes with, with the intention of deception uh, and, and ultimate, I mean, ultimately, What's the goal? It's it's the dragon's kingdom. He's trying to build his kingdom. We see that in Genesis six. Right. And and so at the end, as we approach the end of the age, prophetically, we expect the same level of intervention, trying to why to build his kingdom to resist the return of Jesus, because Jesus is coming back to take what he purchased. Oh yeah, and, and that's I think it's soon. But I digress. So number six is the cattle mutilation film, the darkest film I've ever worked on. And at the end of the film, I'll give you the punchline. We believe that the reason why these cows are being mutilated, and the, first of all, blood from a cow, bovine blood, can be used interchangeably in a human transfusion. Most people don't know that. So bovine blood and human blood can be used interchangeably. Where did you get that information? Do you, I mean, it's, it's just go on the net. It's, okay. It's Ameri just it's, curious. It's absolutely approved. Okay. Now, I've checked, rechecked, and triple checked. Sure. That. It's 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 a known. I'm fact. just say that for people that want to go. Yeah, it's it's a known know. fact. So this, and I, I believe we're the first researchers to put this together on both sides of the aisle. It could be wrong, but that's what, you know, I believe. That what they're using, the material from the cattle mutilations, they are creating artificial wombs for the hybrids to come into full maturity. So that hybrid child is taken, that hybrid entity is taken in the third month of the woman's pregnancy. It can't live outside the womb. So it's placed in an artificial womb. And, and, and abductees have seen these artificial glass-like containers with these different um, hybrids, and they so, look very alien-like. And I realize for some of you, yeah, that's like, whoa. Th that is whoa out there. But talk about how, uh, and I think you've, I think, whether, have you interviewed Dr. David Jacobs? Yeah, we interviewed Dr. David so Jacobs. So talk about him as a secular person and, and his book, you know, uh, Walking Amongst Us, and, and, and talk about the research that he did and how it, how it uh, coincides with your research. Yeah, Dr. David Jacobs, a secular researcher, a professor uh, of history at, at um, uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. We've, I've, I've met him several times and interviewed him several times, and um, he makes no bones about it. That at first, when he got into the phenomenon, he thought it was all delusional. He thought they were just making this stuff up. And then he got to a point where he realized that it was real and that these people, these women that were coming and men that were coming to him were not delusional, not making this stuff up. They were being taken. And produce it. I mean, talk about hubrids. Well, the hubrids, what, what Dr. Jacobs um, believes as I do, and he calls them hubrids, human uh, hybrids, human alien combination. So he, he doesn't know anything about the seed war. He doesn't, yeah, this is religious. He does nothing stuff. about the seed war at all. And he realizes that they are creating an army and walking amongst and us. walking amongst us, and that's the title of his book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So here, we, so here we are again. The goal is to 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 see that as we as we approach the end of the age, these are all the things that are happening behind the scenes. Again, this isn't this isn't Sunday school, you know. No, it's and, not. And, and we know this this is advanced, uh, deep, deep deep end of the pool. Yeah, deep end of the pool here in the, in that regard, and and of course, you know. Uh, God hasn't called everybody to be experts on this, but what we're saying is the research that is happening here uh, is is trying to help 
as many people as possible that are caught up in the New Age or other things to say, hey, look, we're, we're providing, trying to seek a biblical framework for what is coming. And so the things that are happening again with the government and, and these rumors and, the, and Hollywood media is bringing it together in a, in a very systematic biblical framework to say, hey, everybody, wake up, be aware. First Peter 3.15, always prepared to give a defense. As you hear these things, you can say, well, hey, you, you're hearing this out there. And again, in the New Age framework, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But the Bible speaks about this, right? And and as it relates to Very again, the, clearly. The, the abductions. So your series again takes it from the beginning all the way through, which I think is extremely helpful for those that are called. Which we're all called to have an answer. Again, that doesn't just not just limited. It's 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 the answer is to be more than just the biblical, uh, the gospel certainly. But this this is this is the three dimensional aspect of the gospel and the seed war. What Jesus accomplished in order to win everything back, not just salvation. For us, but uh, again, the the defeat of his enemies. So y- you get into what's what's seven, film seven. Well, seven and eight are on Roswell. Okay. And seven is uh, uh, Roswell revisited, exoneration. Okay. And in that film, we sat down with uh, the heirs of the Marcel family, Linda Marcel, Denise Marcel. Uh, there's also an interview I conducted with Jesse Marcel Jr before he passed away. So for those that have no idea of Marcel, they have no idea what that means. Explain it. Okay, 1947, Roswell, New Mexico. The 509th bombing group is stationed in Roswell, New Mexico. They are the only atomic bomb group on the planet. And they are there. And... Is this uh, the same group that dropped the bombs? This is the same group that dropped the bomb in Nagasaki, okay. Hiroshima. Okay. So they're, they're the only... I mean, this is... It's early. early. This is 47. Yeah, 47. This is, I mean, they, they dropped the bombs in 45. So... so they're there, and um, there's outside of Roswell is open range for cattle. I mean, it's just miles and miles of range, you know, Nothing. open range. <laughs> it's just barren. Un- yeah. yeah, it's unbelievable. And this rancher, Mac Brazel, comes into town, and he and he says something crashed out on my out of my ranch. This is what it looks like. Uh, because there's an Air Force base near, right? right. So he's, he's thinking trying maybe to figure out maybe, maybe it's a from plane, the Air Force, okay. something like that. So the sheriff goes and calls up Marcel who Jesse Marcel Sr. is the 509th group, Army group, intelligence officer, highly trained. He's a major at the time, Major Jesse Marcel Sr. He's highly trained. He knows what's out there. And he accompanies Mac Brazell out to the ranch. And he sees a debris field, which is three football fields long. It's huge. And he picks up some of the wreckage. He's never seen anything like it puts it in the box, several boxes, and brings it home and shows his wife and son, Jesse Marcel Jr. Yeah, so his 11-year-old son wakes him up. At 3 o'clock in the morning. Son, you want to see something cool? And, I mean, right? And you don't wake your wife up at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, okay? not for something dumb. No, uh, unless something's going on. And it, he has it spread out on the, on the kitchen floor and the, uh, and the kitchen table, and he says to his wife and son, look at this, because you might never see anything like it again. It's from something from another world. And he takes it back to the base. The, the Roswell Daily Paper runs an article, uh, Army Recovers Crash. Do we, do we know who let them know about the story? Was it him? Well, it's Marcel. And or was then, it the sheriff then, or the rancher, maybe? What? That, that let that the rancher, Marcel Sr., maybe a sheriff, sharing that information with the local paper. Do we that, know? Would be, uh, that would be Halt, H-A-U-T. Halt's how, the public relations guy. For? For for the the five hundred ninth. Oh, okay. So 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 he's the one official that, that said, "Hey, by right, the way, right. this is what happened." And he's collaborating with Jesse Marcel at the time. Yeah, so early, he, early. Yeah, mm-hmm. and so the headlines comes out: Army recovers, you know, crashed UFO, crash yeah, flying this. saucer. Yeah, flying saucer. Well, this. Yeah, huh? it's right there. Twenty four hours later, that story is redacted, and and you, General Ramey says excitement not justified. What does that mean? You know, Army empties uh, flying saucer. What does that mean? And so Ramey gets a hold of Marcel Sr. and does a bait and switch. Arranges a arranges a press conference. Press conference, right? Yeah. And Marcel trots in. He's a patsy. The cameras are going. Click, click, click. Flash bulbs. And in front of him is not the records that he saw. There's a weather balloon there. And Marcel is holding the weather balloon, looking at Ramey like, "You've got to be kidding me." Yeah, this is not what it yeah, is. This yeah. is not. What, and we both know that. And we have a clip in the film that we that we got, and um, in that clip, it's Jesse Marcel Sr. back 
on the debris field for the first time. And he's talking very candidly about what happened. How much later? From, oh, he's an old man. He's an old man. So he's on the end. So he's out yeah. there explaining for the, first time. for the first time what he saw. And, and he says this. But of course, Gemma Ramey and I knew differently. And we stopped the film and we just font that. And we just let that, that sentence appears on the screen. A lot with Jesse Marcel. Let that senior, ruminate a little bit. But, but Ramey and I, Gemma Ramey and I knew differently. Basically stating that they knew that this weather balloon was not the records that they were brought in. So at the time, was there any, um, was there anything that leaked about, uh, obviously there was physical stuff there of a craft. Was there any uh, connection to biologics at that time or biology? And bodies? There were not, there were two crash sites. It was a skip site. In other words, the UFO came in like this, it hit, and that's where it broke apart. Okay. And then it traveled another 15 to 17 miles to Corona, and that's where the bodies were. The final, were. Oh, okay. Yeah. So there so, were bodies. There were bodies, absolutely. And they were, they were once again, you got Glenn Dennis, who was the, uh, the mortician in Roswell. Yeah, so it's, yeah, get, get, explain Who talked that. about you know, getting the small caskets. He was dating this nurse who talked about seeing the bodies and the stench was- Wait, 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 you're going too fast. Okay. okay. The, the small caskets, what in the world is that about? Well, because these, these entities that were- So who called? I mean, okay. I mean, the, the Army, the Air Force, right? All hit, the mortician. Calling Glenn Dennis, the mortician, going, hey- um, By the way. <laughs> by the way, you got any small caskets? And so he bought, he bought the caskets over. So, so he's, he just gets a phone call. They're asking for small caskets. Why? Yeah, and he's just like, well, sure, okay, yeah, maybe I have and some children. And remember, the grays, the bodies that were recovered in, in the crash at Corona were the grays, mm -hmm. three to four feet. They're, they're about the size of a 10-year-old child. We hear this over and over and yeah. over again. And so uh, we show in our film this deathbed confession by Colonel Hill, who is at the end of his life. He's approaching 90 years old. He's got about a month to live. It's a deathbed confession, a month to live. And Jim and Carolyn Rankin, are his caretakers and they're helping him go through the end of life process and one day out of the blue carolyn asked him what about roswell because so who is he well colonel hill is is oss he's that's the forerunner of the cia cia was he, was he, he was an intelligence officer in world war ii okay so he's like you know so he's just he's not necessarily part of the 509 no 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 he he's just, outside but, but, he's but he's you know oss he can go anywhere he wants to go anywhere he's told to go, intelligence officer, that's where he goes. So um, he's, Carolyn asks him, what about Roswell? And Hill goes, what about it? Was it a weather balloon? And Hill drops his head like this and lets out a deep sigh and goes, wasn't a weather balloon. And then he begins to tell Carolyn the story that he was flown from Dallas, Fort Worth to Roswell, New Mexico, 48 hours after the event. One of the aliens, so-called aliens, was still alive. As an intelligence officer, he tried to communicate with it. He couldn't. They had six fingers, according to Kill testimony. They had the almond black eyes, the large heads, and they were the size of a ten-year-old child. So, and so deathbed so, confession. So that's in our film. So that's in this film, the Ros. Yeah, okay. So, Roswell. so I want people to grasp something here. That, uh, and this is this is a, this is a disagreement. I think even amongst some of the uh, prophecy teachers, or even those that that a lot of those things are, are not real, it's delusional, or maybe it's government-owned or, or government, or, you know, technology that's, that's physical. But this is, in the same way that a Nephilim, supernaturally, right. was a physical being, it physical wasn't just being. a spiritual being. No, not at all. In the same way, we would not be surprised then if uh, here we are at the end of the age, really close to Days the of establishment of Israel, right, right? Is, starting the end of the age, that there would be some, Lord, uh, some sort of physical hybrid that again is a supernatural uh, product. It's a product of a supernatural intervention. I mean, again, that, that's not surprising. So to have a, a little three foot, four, four foot gray, I've, I've, I've never seen one, I'm not saying I have, but it doesn't surprise me, it doesn't ruin my faith to think that you'd have something physical here. Right. It's not just a spiritual demon. Uh, demon is, is immaterial. This was a real something. Yeah. It was real, the bodies were real, they were all- The craft is real. Yeah, everything was flown to Wright-Patterson. Mm -hmm. That's what Colonel Hill said before they, he passed away. Yeah, these aren't just lights in the sky, it's demonic delusion. These are actually physical things, which again, it brings up a lot of other questions. You know, where did this metal come from? Where was it mined? You know, uh, who, 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 who was creating this, fabricating and it? And where? And where? But you know, it's funny how 
you know, we, we have this truncated view of the supernatural, yet we know from the Book of Enoch that there's this quid pro quo going on, that they come down and they create, they show mankind, early mankind, the art of metallurgy. I yeah. mean, we know that from the, now you could throw out the Book of Enoch and say, well, it's not part of our canon, and, you know. But, but, but you see metallurgy but, and the, the explosion of this technology in Genesis 4. So that that's a biblical model anyway. Right, it is. So where does it come from? Yeah, where does it come from? Yeah. Where did, all of a sudden, boom, there's this explosion of knowledge. Yeah, boom. exactly. Tubal Cain. So even though we, we reference the book of Enoch, we don't we know it's not scripture, but it, that is providing well, a we framework. We appreciate its historicity and, we, and it gives us a framework. Especially because you know, Jude, yeah. Jude 14 yeah, quotes absolutely. it. Absolutely. So does it make it scripture, but it does provide some extra background yeah. to the Genesis 4, which and is if, a precipitation of Genesis 6. And if you were going to keep one book out of the hands of the people of this earth, that's the book you keep out, mm -hmm. no matter what. You don't, don't read Enoch, whatever you do, don't read Enoch, because all Enoch does is just explode Genesis 6. It really does. So, so here, the, the film 7 and 8 here, Roswell 1 and 2, basically, you, you decided, I want to do a deep dive on this. I'm going to present the information. I want to go back for a moment, because we mentioned Jesse Marcel Sr. He has this 11-year-old son, which you referenced, Junior. Right. Who grows up? He grows up as the son of this famous guy. Right. Uh, he marries. He has. He has. He has children, um, or at least one child, uh, and then he he gets married. Now you, which I thought was awesome, you interviewed his daughter, yeah, Jesse Marcel Jr.'s daughter, right. which is the granddaughter of right. Senior, right. as well as the the daughter-in-law of Senior. Um, that's kind of unprecedented. That what an honor that was. It was, and and you know Denise was very. Very good on camera, and she was very forthcoming. Denise, who's Denise? Denise is, is the daughter. The of, daughter. Of, sorry about that. Denise is the daughter of Jesse Marcel Jr., and she talks about the whole thing. What I mean by that is 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 how it impacted the family, yep. um, because you know it impacted the family in a great way. Linda Marcel, who's Jesse Marcel Jr.'s wife, said the same thing that it impacted their family in ways that are just unbelievable. There was a stigma with the Marcel name. And so that's why we call the film Exoneration, because as a filmmaker, um, I looked at this and I was really, really ticked off. There was a film that came out in 2016 by a group of Christians that at the end of the film, they insisted that the Roswell event was a weather balloon. They did? Yeah. And I sat there and I was really ticked off about that because they hadn't done their homework, in my opinion. So that's did they interview uh, either one of them in no, their film? No, they did not. Oh, okay. No, and certainly, and Jesse Marcel uh, Jr. was not alive by then. I don't believe he passed away a few years earlier. But I got to interview him. He was there at the Roswell conventions all the time, and that's how I got to interview him. And I know that this particular film crew, and I'm not going to disparage anybody. Look, they're in, you know, they're brothers in the Lord, and God bless them. But you know, let's let's tell the truth. Let's find out. Well, what the or truth at least is. Have, uh, do an interview. Do something. Get first and they, and they, they yeah. never interviewed him. And at the end of their film, they basically state that Roswell was a weather balloon. And, and what? Did. So everything that Jesse and his family were it was all made up. Basically? Yeah, that's that's the thing. That's why the that film was the was taste called, that they left. Yeah, basically, yeah. But they never interviewed anybody. They never got the other side of the story. And that's what. That's why we made exoneration. And if it's just a weather balloon, then what did we find in a debris field? So, so okay, that gets into it. There's into, your segue. That gets into the segue of, of film two, right. where again the, the subtitle is the debris field. So you go there. You yeah. so that you go there when? We went there. Uh, we, well, we actually uh, flew into um, Albuquerque and then drove to Roswell. Which was where? Was that July? This was July no, of oh no no it, it was um. You know, I'd have to look. I honestly. But was it this year? Yeah, this year. Yeah, this yeah. year. So yeah. basically, so 2023. June, July of this year, 2023. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, the head begins to spin. There's just too many. Right. You've been doing a lot this year, right. for sure. So we're out there and we, and we interviewed um, uh, Dennis Baltazer, who's a ufologist, who's been studying Roswell for decades, as well as Frank Kimbler, who was our guide to the, uh, to the debris field. And we, we film in the Roswell Museum. And thank you, Roswell Museum, for allowing us to film there. And Frank Kimbler had pieces of the metal, which he showed me. And he also found three buttons in the debris field, and he had those aluminum buttons, and they were, they, he, he did the deep dive on it, and did the research on it. These buttons were from military fatigues from the 40s to the 1950s. That's so the clearly, time. That, that shows you, at least from an archaeological perspective, 
some level of co corroboration that you have military people there. So it's not like you were what, in some random field. You yeah, were in the right place. We were in the right place. And why are we finding all these buttons in, in the debris field? Because they went shoulder to shoulder on their hands and knees, Mondo. They looking, lied, looking they for lied, look, They picked up every piece. But again, we show this in the, in, the, uh, in, the, in the clip from the White Sands. It was probably smuggled out of White Sands. We don't know the source of it. But it shows when the UFO hits, it explodes with such an unbelievable force that it, it's just mind-boggling. Things went into the earth. And things like a, like a 22 bullet right into the earth. They didn't get it all. They didn't get it all. And the buttons are proof that they're out there trying to get it all, yeah. but they didn't. So we're out there with metal detectors, and we pray to the Lord, you know, please show us something. Give us favor. Show us what you want to show us if you can. And <clears throat> we're done the prayer. We're still sort of in, in the prayer huddle, Gil Zimmerman and Jim Peterson and myself. And Frank Kimber is about, Kimber is about uh, 50 yards away, 35 yards away. He wasn't away. part of the prayer. No, no. And, and Chuck Zukowski, they're with the metal detectors out there. Frank goes, hey, guys, I got something. Come over. So we go running over, cameras are still rolling. And you have and this goes, in film too. It's all in the film. Okay. Deet, deet, deet. And the, and the metal detector's going off. So he puts the, we make a mark where the metal where he found something, and we put the metal detector down, and he's a little, little shovel, and he's going like this, and he's digging it out. To cut to the chase, he's got a little pile of dirt. So here's the metal detector. He's taking the dirt and he's going like this. This is, this Not is, going. This is called sifting. This, this is called archaeology, sifting, right? Yeah. Archaeology. Yeah. Nothing there. Next pile. Nothing there, picks up another one, beep, now it's in his hand. So he splits it, sifting, splits it in half, it's not in there, beep, it's in this one, opens it up, goes like this and goes, oh my gosh. And we have one. And we, we show it in the film, we take, once we get all the dirt away from it, he holds it, I pour water over it, we put it in my hand, and there it is. And it's a priest from a debris field. <clears throat> it's from a craft from another world. So, well, I mean, what if it's just a piece of a plow or something? That I get that, was, so, and that's so, what the naysayers will say. So, well, so how do you? How do but you? We it? went and we had the metal tested because that's what we do. Sure. As as armchair scientists, we you know sit there and just criticize. Oh, well, that. maybe it is. No, no, we we got the metal tested. You got the metal tested. Just like our DNA evidence that you and I went. Yep. We go down there. This isn't pseudoscience, folks. This is Mondo and I in Peru complete with lab suits, going zzz, zzz, and taking fresh powder from the foramen magnum, dumping it in and tagging and bagging it and then sending it off to three different labs. Mm -hmm. That's hardcore science, we're not pseudoscience. So we find the metal and it's amazing because it's folded in on itself. It's unlike anything I've ever seen. It shows, just from a naked eye, you can see something traumatic has happened here. And the metallurgy was tested. The closest thing that comes to it is a, um, aluminum alloy from a 6000 series, okay? But it's not a match. Mm. And it was tested in two different labs. We found two pieces of metal. Two different labs, 6000 series, but it's a metal alloy that's unknown on this planet. Wow. So, so let, let's kind of bring this all together cuz uh, you know, we're running out of time here. So, let's transition to your final film, which again is now out next month. Uh, It'll be finished in December. What It'll is come the truth? What is the truth? So here, let's bring this back to somebody listening, and, and they're 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 intrigued, and but maybe they have just caught the title. Uh, give this spiritual application here. I mean, your goal isn't just to exonerate, you know, people. It, it is to point people to the gospel. So kind of do do that for us as it relates to what is the truth number nine, and then to the gospel message. What is the truth? Sits down with people like Nick Pope, Nick Redford, George Norrie all on the other side of the of the aisle, as it were, and others. And then we've got Josh Peck and Derek Gilbert and Gonzi Shimura and, and, and yours truly, Mondo Gonzalez and Gary Stearman and others. There's a whole bunch of people, and it's very staccato-like. We go from Nick Pope to Nick Redford to, let's say, Derek or Josh or myself or whatever, and we leave it up to the people to decide what is the truth. What are we saying here? We, we, can't, we can't disparage anyone who doesn't believe and the biblical prophetic no, narrative. No, that's not the goal. And that's not, that's not what we're trying to do. So we let people say and, and speak their truth. What is their truth? But what is the truth? Mm -hmm. And our truth is based on the biblical prophetic narrative. And we give Gary Stearman, elder brother, the last word. And you're sort of second right up to him. And then I'll close it in, in some um, way that doesn't you know, lean, lean the thing over to our side. We believe that this is biblical. Yeah, and we're we not going to apologize for that. I mean, no. you know. Not at all. We believe 
that this, this dovetails right into Jesus' own words that even the elect would be deceived, that men faint for fear was coming on the, upon the earth, that Satan comes with all signs and lying wonders. We, we know that these are warnings by Jesus and Paul. We are here in the window of time. This is what's manifesting. There are only two paradigms. One is that these are extraterrestrials. The other one is that these are interdimensional with a very nefarious agenda. And I think we have shown, without a shadow of a doubt, in all nine films, which will be available in one box set as soon as at, yeah. at some point in time next year, but not this year. They'll all be available on our streaming site, streaming.lamarzuli.net. Of course, you can buy them at Prophecy Watchers too. Yeah. So the, I think we're going to carry. Site, yeah, you're going to have. We're going to carry your streaming yeah, gonna, too. Uh, soon, yeah. So you can get it on both sides. But we we need to do this because we're the only Christian ministry that I'm aware of. Nine films that really does a deep dive on the phenomena from a biblical viewpoint, biblical worldview. Well, I think that, you know, this is the coming great deception. Yeah, as we wrap this up, I mean, what we know is, again, thinking about going all, you know, you and I for a lot of years in archaeological stuff, is that the data, the goal is to get the, the real get data, the data out there. The right. data is out there. The data is true. Now, again, you're going to have secular people interpret that data in their way, you know, whatever. But for us, first of all, the data is there then we're going to interpret it through a biblical framework, which again, which coincides with what you just said, right. that they, as we approach the end of the age, there's going to be this, this supernatural intervention with the, with the goal of, of deception, just like Genesis 6. And so, you know, as, as you're listening, uh, keep, keep an eye out, uh, you know, check our, our, our website, LA's website. Uh, all this information is there. It'll equip you. It'll, it'll equip the person to understand what's coming. And we expect more. We expect more over the next however long it is, which is like we've been seeing over the last couple of years, uh, more stuff coming out of the government. Again, they're going to have their own perspective too, oh, but yeah. the data is there. So variety of interpretations, but we want to provide to you, again, a spiritual answer to what we're seeing and also to be able to have real conversations with people because they're going to be watching Tucker. They're going to be watching the government uh, meetings, the, the con congressional hearings. And we wanted to say, hey, don't be caught off guard. Don't be so blinded. Uh, you know, you could be in the church. We love the church. But many times people in the church aren't, aren't equipped. And that's the goal is to equip people. It's to equip people and warn people of the coming great deception because I, that's a phrase I coined in 1998, yeah. like we said earlier. And I truly believe this is it. This is the coming great deception. Men faint from fear for what's coming upon the earth. Yeah. But we go up, they show up. Yeah. We go up, they come down. Yeah, here we are. Again, and we, we've talked about that in the context as it relates. Billy and I had a conversation on a previous podcast about what that looks like for explaining away the rapture. That's a whole other one. But L.A., appreciate your time. Thank you, Mondo. Always great to be yep, here. Yep, the Week in Bible Prophecy. Here we are. Uh, you know, continue to come back to us. We're going to... We're going to be here until the Lord comes and, uh, and to share about what, all that's happening. So if you, if, again, join us in Orlando, orlandoprophecysummit.com. Uh, L.A. will be there talking about, again, this as relates to all the things that are happening uh, really up to speed. So appreciate you listening this week and uh, catch us next time.